Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. We're finally moving on to chapter 6 from chapter 5. We've been in uh, Matthew chapter 5 for uh, quite a while as we've been walking through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, while you're turning there, I wanted to begin with a psalm, just a sort of, uh, uh, just a good starting point, not only to frame and uh, help us lead into our, our lesson text uh, for this morning, but really just to help uh, create a healthy perspective for us uh, overall, uh, a, healthy, a healthy reminder, sort of as uh, Joe said at the beginning of his uh, Lord's Supper talk. I, it's interesting, I get the privilege of when I, I have the sermon topic and sermon theme in my mind, and so you see all sorts of patterns and connections and themes uh, in songs that are chosen or, or in thoughts that are shared or or even words that are said in our prayers. And so um, I wanted to read this psalm, and then you went to the idea of, uh, of uh, how important it is for us to be reminded of eternal truths, and that that is part of why we not only come around the table, but that's why we come together at all uh, in our assemblies. And so Psalm 93 is just a really important reminder for us that God reigns. That's what it's titled in my Bible in the ESV, the Lord reigns. This is what, this is what the psalmist says. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful reminder that, that the Lord truly is, reigns and is in charge and is above all. His, his name is above all names. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And that's a really important thing for us to get in here and to get deep in here into the depths of our heart, to know that uh, even though this last year plus has not really felt like anyone was in charge, (laughs) there's times of chaos all throughout the year, all throughout our lives. Part of the reason that we come together like this, uh, part of the reason we sing songs not just to the Lord, but to one another, as Scripture says to do, is to remind us, to remind each other of these eternal truths. Because we don't always feel that this is true, right? I mean, we don't always feel that the Lord truly is in control, for my life seems to get chaotic quite often. We don't always uh, believe that God is good because these bad things happen. And so sometimes we need to come together, not only in the presence of God, but in the presence of community like this, in order to be reminded ourselves and to sing to ourselves like David does in the Psalms. He says, why are you downcast, oh my soul? He starts to talk to himself. You ever done that? That's part of why we come together, is to remind each other that this truly is uh, a truth, that God reigns. And uh, we've talked a little bit about it in our class even um, this morning in seasons of transitions. It's important to hold on to the promises uh, of God. And so I say that to say welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. It's, it's encouraging each week to see another new face or two who have been primarily online or haven't been able to be here in a, in a long while. I'm encouraged to see that. And I also know that we have many people uh, online still worshiping with us uh, in, in spirit this morning. And, and, uh, and not only that, but we have many uh, visitors who stumble across uh, our, our news feed on Facebook and on YouTube. And we're so glad that you are here and our visitors here um, this morning. As you can tell on the, on the title slide behind me, we're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to cover really a, a, a much larger section than we have been um, the past uh, handful of weeks. But I, I think we're going to see a really central point, really one point that Jesus is driving home in a couple of sections here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 um, through 18. So um, if you have your Bibles, read along with me. We'll read the text and we'll unpack it um, together. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1. This is what Jesus says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing 
so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. He goes on. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. He goes on. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, he says, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. There's a whole lot of, uh, the whole lot that Jesus packs into uh, these 18 verses. Primarily, he talks about giving, prayer, and fasting. Uh, but he really is not just focusing on these three things. He's really focusing on one central point, the idea of where do our motives lie? Where is our heart? When we practice righteousness, uh, does the inside meet the outside? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever uh, been on the receiving end of something uh, that was anonymous, maybe a secret blessing. Uh, I was thinking, as I thought about this question myself, uh, one of the most profound um, examples of this in my own life was shortly after I came back from uh, South Africa. For those of you who don't know, I was in South Africa for about 18 months through this mission program called AIM, Adventures in Missions, and afterwards, um, I'm moving back to the United States, and I'm thinking, okay, what now, right? And so I think, well, uh, maybe I'll go uh, to college. And so I start touring some different Christian colleges. I know I wanted to pursue uh, Bible. I know I wanted to, I was really interested in admissions still. And so I, I looked at different um, Christian universities and I had my, my heart set on one particular university, um, Harding University. And there's a variety of reasons for that, but maybe three days before I went, um, I was going to move to Searcy, Arkansas. I was going to be a missions major. I was doing all these things. I had all these goals, all these plans. And then there was an anonymous, to this day, an anonymous caller who called my father and said uh, that if I chose to go to Fried Hardeman uh, University in Henderson, Tennessee, that uh, um, this anonymous person, after scholarships, after everything else, would pay for the rest of my tuition. And I was absolutely floored. On the one hand, I didn't in any way want to go to Fried Hardeman because <laughs> that's where my parents went. That's where my grandparents went. And I didn't want to be told what to do, right? So I, my angsty, you know, uh, early 20s uh, self said, I'm going somewhere else, right? And well, the Lord has a sense of humor. He led me there. And I, of course, I, I found my wife there, or, or maybe it was more of a divine providence type of thing. But uh, that's where I met Amber. And, and uh, history is, uh, uh, that's, that's history, right? I mean, I can't imagine where I would be if I didn't go there and didn't have the family I have, I wouldn't have um, been connected to Cooperstown because that's where I, I knew Chet uh, Duke. And so you, you see all the ways that uh, the Lord blesses you in that way. But, but I, I'll never forget that moment. And still to this day, the impact, on the one hand, there's the, the gift itself, which was a, a substantial gift, a gift, of course. But there's still something in the back of my mind that says, who in the world did that? <laughs> who in their right mind did that anonymously? Who is it? Because it haunts me because that means I have to be nice to every single person because I don't know who did it, right? <laughs> have you ever been on the receiving end of, of a secret blessing? Maybe something big, maybe something small. Maybe you're at, uh, eating at a restaurant with your family and uh, having a good time, and then uh, the waitress comes and says, um, good news, your, your meal has been paid for. 
and you're looking around, you know, who, who did it, right? So on the one hand, there's a bit of gratitude, right? There's, you're grateful that someone had this random act uh, of kindness towards you. But then there's also this gratitude that you are forced to give to God. You don't know who to thank, so you just understand this is, this is a blessing that I have, I have received. But on the other hand, you start to wonder. You start to look around. You start to see who's looking at you, right? Because there's sort of this obsession in the back of your mind of, I got to know who did this. Right? I, I got to know who, who blessed me in this way. Or let's flip it around. Have you ever done something anonymously for someone else? Done something in secret for someone else? It could be uh, financial in nature. It could be a service uh, a project for them that they didn't know about. Uh, it could be a host of, of different things, you know, uh, some way that you bless someone else secretly. How did you feel when you did that? How, how did you feel when you blessed someone? Well, on the one hand, perhaps there was, you felt pretty good. You know, this is kind of exciting, you know. Uh, I'm, they have no idea the look on their face when I'm looking from afar to see the way that they, they, the joy that it brought them to receive this secret blessing. But on the other hand, isn't there a little bit part of you that kind of wishes they knew it was you? Maybe not a grand standing ovation with a round of applause, but ah, just a simple acknowledgement, a quick little thank you. Not a big thank you, but just there's a part of us that really wants it not to be in secret, right? We want, it to, we, we want a little bit of acknowledgement, a little bit of, of praise. And so the question for us this morning is, why? Why do we want that? What part of our hearts wants to be seen by other people? You see, when we read this text that we read, it's easy for us to think of applying this text in big categories. So Jesus uses the extreme example of these Pharisees who are blowing the trumpet and saying, look at me, look at me. Well, well, we may not do that. That's not perhaps the type of people we are. But in the small things, maybe we do. Maybe we, maybe we do relate a little bit with the Pharisees, don't we? A quick little thank you, a quick little nod, thank you, thumbs up, something. Right? We want to be praised and seen by other people. Why do we desire this? Why do we desire this? Well, as you've already seen in the text this morning, this isn't new. As so many things that Jesus talks about, we realize in the teachings of Jesus that this is not some old book that doesn't apply. Right? When you read this book, you realize, wow, maybe there's some names I can't pronounce in certain passages. But when you read the story of God... When you read the, creation, the creator God and the way he, he creates uh, humanity, the, the covenant with Abraham, the way that covenant is fulfilled through Israel and then culminates in the Messiah Jesus, and you see the expectations that King Jesus has for his people, specifically in this sermon, you realize this, it, he, Jesus is addressing a human condition, and that, doesn't, that is not bound by time. When he talks about these, these subjects we've talked about in Matthew chapter 5, when he talks about the lust of the heart, that's a, that's a problem for human beings. It doesn't matter what age you live in. When he talks about anger and greed and, and anxiety and all these sorts of things that we read about in the sermon, we realize, man, this really hits home. And so does this subject. Why do we desire, whether big or small, to be seen by other people? Well, Jesus really gets uh, at the heart of this. If you remember uh, in, in, our, in our context um, here... In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, this is what Jesus says. This is what he says as he leads into all these many sermonettes, sometimes it's called, these many subjects. When he talks about, uh, when he talks about uh, murder and adultery and all these things, you heard it was said, but I say. He begins by all of this um, after talking about how important it is to be salt and light of the earth, about having an impact on, on the world. That as Christians, we don't just live in our little box. We don't, it's not just about filling the pew, but it's about living in a way that impacts our neighborhood. Uh, he says very, very straightforwardly in verse 20 of chapter 5, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And we, we talked about how mind-blowing this statement must have been for Jesus' original hearers. For who is more righteous than the Pharisees? I mean, they are so committed to the scriptures, Right? The 600 and something laws that we read about in the, in the, in the Old Testament, 
That's nothing. We have thousands now. Right? We are committed to obeying the scriptures. And Jesus says, you've got to get way past them if you want to enter the kingdom. Right? And we understand that when Jesus goes on to continue in his sermon that the way you exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees is by digging into the condition of your heart. Right? You've got to dig into the condition of your heart. And so in chapter 5, as we've seen, he talks about, you heard it was said, and he quotes scripture or maybe an interpretation of scripture. And then he says, but I say, but I say. And he digs into the intent of what God has for his people. But as we transition into chapter 6, we see that it's not just about a healthy understanding of scripture, a healthy understanding of law, but that that our, our, the way we understand what God expects for us must translate into right living. And so these Pharisees, he calls them uh, hypocrites, right? He calls them uh, these, these, these actors. And he says, you've got to get way deeper than that. We'll talk about that uh, in just a minute. But if you just want to know what the point of the sermon is, I'm just going to make it very clear. You can write it down and you can clock out if you want. But this is what Jesus says, okay? This is the point of the sermon, the intention of our actions matters to God. Or in another way, how you do what you do matters to God. You have to understand how radically different this idea was in the days of Jesus. For in many of the pagan religions of the time, especially those of Rome, um, it didn't really matter if, you, if what you believed and what you did matched, Right? As long as you went through the actions, it didn't really matter what you felt or believed or thought. As long as you did it. As long as you paid your taxes to Caesar and you, and you, you denied Christ, you denied your God or whatever, unless you did these actions, it didn't really matter if you believed it, you could just say the words. But Jesus and the rest of the New Testament writers help us to understand that what we do and what we say have to match. Think for a moment back to the example of Daniel and his friends, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They do not bow down to this tall statue that King Nebuchadnezzar made. Why? Because what you do and what you say have to match. And Jesus gets to the heart of it, right? That our intentions matter. It's not just about the outward expression. It's about the inward motive that matters to God. So he says here in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 6, this is our theme verse. This is the, this is the central point that Jesus, Jesus makes in verse 1 of chapter 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So he gives the example of giving. He gives the example of prayer. He gives the example of fasting. And you can keep going down the list if you want of all these different spiritual di disciplines, all these different expectations God has for us. But at the end of the day, the point is clear. Beware of practicing your righteousness for, uh, before others in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. A few times, Jesus calls these Pharisees hypocrites. And this is a, a popular word that we like to throw around, but perhaps we don't really know what the word means. He says it in verse 2, verse 5, and verse 16. Verse 2, thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. He says here in, uh, in, in verse 5 about prayer. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. He says again in verse 16 about fasting. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. What does the word hypocrite mean? Well, the word hypocrite is just a transl trans transliteration of a word that, that, that means a play actor. It's someone who was in a theater. Someone who was in a theater was a hypocrite. They had a, a mask on, and they spoke from behind the mask, right? They had a persona. They had a character. That they had an outward expression that was not really them, right? And today we see that all the time in, in movies and TV shows or in live theater. We see these people who play this character and embody this character. And there's a reason that we can be moved to tears or moved to laughter and we know that these aren't actually real people, right? When you watch a movie and you're bawling your eyes out, you know in the back of your mind that that's an actor, right? And they play all these lines. But there's something convincing about that role if they do it right. 
Well, this is what Jesus is saying, that these Pharisees are just actors. They're just participating in a play, that their face doesn't match their heart. Their body language doesn't match their heart. Their actions don't match their heart. And he says, don't be like them. He says, when the Pharisees give, when they pray, when they fast, they do it in order to be seen by other people. In contrast, kingdom people, Christ's followers, they do what? They seek to do things in secret, in private. And what exactly does he mean by this? Because on the, on the surface, it seems pretty self-explanatory. But then you remember verse 16 of chapter 5, don't you? He says, let your light shine before others. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. So which is it, Jesus? Do we let our light shine before others or do we do it in secret? I thought we weren't supposed to put the light under the basket, right? That's what I sang as a kid is... Let your light shine before others. He says, do it in secret. What is Jesus getting at here? You see, it's not just about whether you're physically seen. And I think that's a way this passage perhaps has haunted us or maybe has been misapplied in our lives that if anyone physically sees something that I'm doing that's good, I've lost a reward in heaven, whatever that might mean. That's not what Jesus is addressing here. He says that these people are doing, these Pharisees are doing their righteousness and practicing their righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. That's an intent, right? That's an intent. That's a motive. The goal is to be seen by other people. And in contrast, he says, our goal, our desire must be to be seen by God. I mean, that, that's the heart of a Christ follower. That what I do and what I say, at the end of the day, the only person that matters is God. And I want to be seen by God. I want him to delight in me. I want want him to say, my good and faithful servant, whatever that might look like, whatever friendships I might lose, I I want to be pleasing to God. I want to be seen by God. So it's not just a matter of whether or not you're you're, you're physically seen or someone sees you, you know. Um, if, you, if you write a check when you give to the church here, we see your name on it, right? <laughs> That's not what it's talking about, is it? No, it's, it's talking about your motive, the intent of your heart. I had a, a, a man I really looked up to, a, a quiet, um, more of a, a, a timid man um, who I've known my entire life, an older man uh, in the church growing up in Anchorage, uh, Alaska, and uh, just a hero of mine. I love him dearly. Uh, I won't say his name in case, you know, someone who knows him is watching online. I don't want to uh, embarrass him or anything. But he, he just told me he had a really hard time. He did a lot of behind the scenes. Like he, he did a whole lot with, um, you know, work around the building. He did a lot of work with our technology. He did all sorts of stuff. But um, he wanted, uh, he, he was approached about being more involved um, in more of a, a public way, whether it be leading prayer or serving on the table or those sorts of things. But this is the passage that haunted him. He said, I, I don't want to be seen by other people. And, and one of the things that in our conversations we had to sort of get down to was, it's not just about whether you're physically seen, right? I'm proclaiming the word of God to you and you're watching me do it. And I think we would acknowledge that the proclamation of the word, whether it's me or somebody else, is a good thing. It's a commanded thing. But it's not about just being seen. It's about the very intent. What is my motive? If I'm up here every Sunday morning and I just only, my only goal is to please you and for, for get a lot of compliments from you after services, uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing right by you. I'm not doing right by me. And I'm not doing right by God. No, in contrast, as I said in our class this morning, it's about the truth, right? It's teaching the truth in love is, is the goal. And so... You know, that's a conversation him and I have. Maybe that's a conversation that, that you've had in your own mind is what, you know, am I allowed to do things in front of other people? Am I allowed to talk to my spouse when I'm fasting? You know, am I allowed to, uh, is anyone allowed to see me pray? You know, so on the one hand, I think we need to not minimize this, the, the secrecy that he talks about, the idea of going into a closet to pray. If you've never gone into a closet to pray, I encourage you to do so, right? Um, there's other ways you can pray in secret, but that's a really beautiful way to pray. Right, just to be in an enclosed space where no one's around you, or to go out in the woods to pray, go out in secret to pray. But understand that at the bottom of it, that, that Jesus is talking about the intent of our hearts. One of my 
favorite examples of this uh, is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 when you have Hannah, right? Hannah really wants to have a child. She can't. And we think we, we can connect with that in our own day, but it is to think about how painful of experience that must have been for her in, in her day is unfathomable. It's just, it's hard to, to relate with. But she, she goes to the temple. She's being haunted by this other woman, and, and she's trying to figure out her role and her place, and she is just pouring her heart out to God. So much so that the Eli, the priest, comes up to her and it just assumes this woman is drunk. Right? Why? Because she was, uh, her, her lips were moving, but her, no words are coming out of her mouth. Now, you and I are more familiar with sort of praying inside of our minds, but for, a, for an Israelite at that time, that, that's not how you prayed. Even the Jews in the days of Jesus did not pray inside their mind. They didn't think their prayers. All prayers were external. Scripture was always read out loud. These are all things that were embodied in reality. And so for her to be so connected to God, she was so in that lane and in that zone that the words just became so internalized, right? There's people all around the temple. The priest comes up to her, but all she sees is God. And all she desires is to be seen by God. And we see the way God blesses her. See, that's what Jesus is getting at here. So the question I want us to think about with the few minutes that we have left is, how do we form our hearts to desire to be seen by God? I mean, how do we get there? Because I think most of us read the passage and we say, I get it. I want to be there. But yet, there's just some part of us that says, I really like the thank you, right? I really like the praise, big or small. How do we get, I want to want it, but how do I get there? And I think, and one of the things I think is really important about this passage is that the Lord's Prayer, when he says this is how you should pray, it functions not only as a, as a, as a structure for our prayer, but it changes our entire perspective. And here's what I mean by this. The Lord's Prayer serves sort of as a, a paradigm. It helps enlarge our perspective. So think about the ways that, so he, he, first of all, before we get to the prayer, he says in verses 7 through 8, he says, when you pray, uh, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Well, in the other three passages, he's talking about these religious Jews, these Pharisees. The Pharisees are hypocrites. The Pharisees are hypocrites. The Pharisees are, hypocrites. The Pharisees are, hip, are hypocrites. But in this passage, he, he starts to get on um, the Gentiles. Don't, don't uh, heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. In polytheistic religions and cultures, it was very common to repeat a phrase over and over and over in order to wake up their God. Rise, wake up, act, move, right? We think about uh, Elijah and, and the prophets of Baal and the back and forth, and, and Elijah says, bring down fire and and the, the rest is history. Uh, the, the Gentile pagan religions, they're, they're, pagan religions are, are serving false gods. <laughs> they're serving idols, things with no power and no life. And so in order for them to, in their minds, move their gods to act, they would say these phrases over and over and over. And Jesus says, you don't have to do that. Why? Because your God is living and your God is active. As we read about in Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. And if that is true... You just get straight to the point. And so my point in saying that is that the Lord's Prayer, in contrast to these, these pagan religions where they're trying to wake up their God, the Lord's Prayer wakes us up to what God is doing. Do you hear me? The Lord's Prayer and the, and the form and the structure we're about to see wakes us up to observe the activity of God in our life and in our world. So what do I mean by this? Number one, he starts with praise, right? He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Sanctified, set apart. You're above us, O oh God. And that's the place that we always begin in our prayers and in our life and in our perspective and in our relationship with God is understanding that God is above all. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. That is an essential place to begin. 
For if we begin our prayer saying, God, I really need help, I really need this, we have, we have zoomed in on ourselves and we have ignored the power and the majesty and the sovereignty of God. And Jesus says, when you pray, this is where you begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Praise. That's why most of our, our songs and our songbooks are, are praise songs, right? Because that orients us. Right? Sometimes when we come into a Sunday morning assembly, we're, we're, not, really, we're not really feeling praise, maybe. Maybe some Sundays we are. But if we've had a hard week, it's hard to sing praise him, praise him. But part of the reason we do that is to remind ourselves that God is worthy of praise. To remind each other that God is worthy of praise. So this is the starting point. And then once you realize that God is above all, then you recognize that that God has a purpose for his creation. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That unlike these, pa these pagan gods who are inanimate, who cannot do anything, our God is alive and active and is above all and is moving. He is active. And we want God to fulfill his purpose. And we want God to fulfill his purpose. Thy will be done, is what we say. And once you do those two things, then petition comes in, right? Give us this day our daily bread. But if you start praying for daily bread before you start, before you praise the name of God, your perspective is all wrong. You don't know what you need. You're praying for the wrong things, right? Isn't it amazing when you start to zoom out and you think about God, you think about how he's worthy of praise, Think about his goodness, his steadfast love. Once you praise God and dwell on the thoughts of God, all of a sudden, sometimes, what you went to prayer to pray about changes. Have you ever had that experience? Where all of a sudden it's like, ah, maybe I don't need to you know, pray for that, for that thing. You know? um, maybe, it's, maybe it wasn't as big of a need as I needed. Or maybe it is a need. Maybe it is daily bread that I need. But now I understand that within this great perspective. But we also understand that it's not just about physical needs, it's about our spiritual needs as well. That we are to be praying for daily forgiveness. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Don't ignore the second part that our relationship with God and God's forgiveness of us is conditional on the way we treat and forgive other people. He hits it really hard in verse 14 and 15. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I don't, I don't know if I need to say anything else about that, do I? He says, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. So we don't just petition for our, our, our daily bread, but we also, we also ask for that daily pardon. Father, forgive me, grow me, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And then, as we move forward, we pray for protection, right? We pray for protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Or your version might say, the evil one. But do you see the movement throughout this prayer? It starts with God, and then it ends with us. But if we begin prayer with us, we're not just praying wrong, but we're, our whole heart and mind is wrong. We have a whole warped and skewed perspective on what really matters. And I believe that this paradigm, if you will, functions not only to structure our prayers, but to structure our perspective. It's not a coincidence that Jesus says this here, that Matthew includes this right here, right? Because it's in the middle of these other three sections. When you give, don't do it like the hypocrites, do it in secret. When you pray, don't do it like the hypocrites. Do it in secret. When you fast, we might say if we fast, but he says when you fast, don't do it like the hypocrites. Do it in secret. And how do you do this? By having a healthy perspective on what really matters. It begins with God, and that leads to us. When we desire the praise of others, when we desire to be seen by others, we have a limited perspective on what really matters. He says, you've, you've received your reward in full, right? If that's what you want and they see you, good job. You got what you wanted, but you didn't get what really matters. 
Jesus challenges us to expand our perspective and in so doing form our hearts to desire God alone to see us. So the question this morning is, as we end is simple. Do you desire to be seen by God? And I want you to really think about that. I want you to search. You are the only one who knows you. But do you, deep within you, desire to be seen by God? When we look at examples throughout Scripture, we see examples of people running from God, hiding from God. We look at the example of Jonah. He says, arise, go to Nineveh. And he goes down to Joppa. He says, I'm going to get a far away from God as possible. And I think we're a little bit like Jonah. I mean, I don't want to see, I don't want to be seen by God. Or at least just let the good parts, let let those be seen by God. But the other things, we'll bury those in a corner. It's not just enough to say God sees us. God knows us. He knows what we need before we ask. But the question is, do we desire that? From the depths of us, do we desire to be seen by God? This is the challenge that Jesus has for us. That if you want to be a Christ follower, as he continues to set the bar higher and higher and higher and higher, he says the very depths of you need to be formed in a way that it's not just about your outward actions, but it's about your inward motives. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we're so grateful for this morning. We're so grateful for the time we have to to come together and to worship you first and foremost, but also to um, encourage one another and to remind one another of what your son has done on the cross, what your your son has done in his body and his blood. And Father, we also remember and we recognize and we believe that you are above all, that you're the King of kings and you're the Lord of lords. And Father, we pray that you continue to form us, form our hearts through the power of your spirit and to your glory. Christ's name. Amen. As always, this, the sermon is yours. Uh, and I, I'm hopeful and I'm prayerful that it's not what I said, but what the words of Jesus perhaps convicted you in, in, in some way. If you're not a Christian, if you're visiting with us online and you're not a Christian, if you're here with us this morning, you're not a Christian, and you want to know a little bit more about what the Christian life is about, we want to study with you. We want to share and remind what the gospel is all about um, with you about the life that you can have in Christ Jesus and the way you can walk in newness of life as you are baptized, immersed into Christ, die, buried, and raised to walk in newness of life. We want to share that joy with you. But for many of us, we are, we are Christians. We've been Christians for a long time, perhaps. And yet, the, the words of Jesus challenge us evermore. And if you need prayers, if you need encouragement, if you need the church to walk with you in a particular way this morning, We always encourage you to come forward now as we stand and sing our invitation song.